Hey guys, Jordan here. Today we're going to be talking about the Intel 285K. When they first launched this, reviews across the board were very clearly mixed. Intel took a more conservative approach with it, stripping things back and taming the thermals to provide a stable, cool running processor. Didn't quite hit the performance people expected though, especially following the monster that was the 4900K. Now fast forward for several months, Intel have been quietly adding updates to the series, one of which has had the potential to make the CPU the performer we actually wanted it to be, Intel 200S Boost. It's basically a firmware level uplift that pushes the chip closer to its full potential without needing any manual tweaking or overclocking. So today we're going to be checking out the updated Ultra 9 285K to see exactly what's changed. We'll go through the test setup, run a full round of benchmarks and gaming tests to see if that 200S Boost actually makes a difference. Now the 285K and memory we're using here were kindly set by Scan Computers UK, a UK retailer that sells everything from PC components, pre-built 3XS systems, pre-audio video gear and even musical instruments. Now we'll leave their links down below and a big thank you for them for sending out the components. Now for the test setup we're going to be running 48GB of 8400MB transfers per second CUDA memory, insanely fast and one of the big perks with the updated platform. It's not cheap but for creatives or anyone running heavy workflows, something certainly worth considering. I've also got results without Qudium for those that are wondering. We'll talk more about that later on. Right, so I'll get the test system set up. I'll run through what we're going to be using for our full test bench and then jump into the benchmarks to see how the 285K performs and now stacks up against AMD. Okay, I've now put the 285K through all of my usual testing to see if the 200S boost actually makes a difference. We're running on the Asus Zenith 90 Hero motherboard that's paired with 48 gigabytes of Corsair Vengeance RGB Kudem that I showed you earlier. That's running at 48 mega transfers per second, CAS Latency 40. Cooling is handled by a Noctua NHD15 and the storage is a Seagate Fire Cooler 530. Graphics are the RTX Tough Edition 4090. Then everything's running off a Corsair HX1500i. Now for the test setup, I'll try to keep things as consistent as possible. This is the same setup minus the CUDA memory that I used when I tested the 285K before. And then for the AMD side of things, the setup is the same minus the board obviously, which is gonna be the Asus X870E-E Strix instead. But I've tried to keep things as consistent as I can. So any changes are just obviously from the BIOS and CPU themselves. So before we dive into the results, there's also one thing I just wanna quickly mention, which is the Asus MCE or multi-core enhancement. Now on some Asus motherboards, the z 90 Hero is one of them, it automatically enables MCE by default, and that basically just removes the Intel's built-in power limits, which lets the CPU draw as much power as it needs to, maintaining maximum boost clocks across all the cores. It basically just makes the chip look faster out of the box, even though you're technically running beyond Intel's official spec. Now we generally use a high tier board when we review any CPUs, just basically eliminates any concern about VRM limits or thermal headroom. It's the cleanest way to see what the chip itself is capable of, but it also does mean that some results might look a little bit higher than what you'd see on a more affordable motherboard, for example. Now for this updated round of testing, I ran three different scenarios to show how things scale depending on your motherboard. So we've got the Intel defaults, which simulate what you'd get on a lower or mid tier board that doesn't have the multi-core enhancement that I just mentioned. We've got Intel 200S Boost, which of course is the new official firmware level boost that they've added with the latest BIOS updates. And then we've got MCU, which is Asus own aggressive tuning. This gives us a fair before and after comparison showing what's new and what's possible across multiple motherboard setups because not everyone is going to be buying a board like this, that's for sure. So enabling the boost is a simple couple of clicks. Even if you're not a fan of doing stuff in the BIOS, it's really simple to do. And also worth noting that if you are running one of these CPUs and you've updated your BIOS and things feel a little bit slower, that setting is off by default. So just something to double check. Okay, so let's go through the charts. We'll start off with the synthetics and then get into gaming. In Cinebench, the difference between Intel's default limits and the new 200S Boost uplift is about 2-3% to in multi-core performance. Geekbench and 3D Mark also tell a similar story, while the 285K matches or even slightly beats the 9950X3D in some tests. Now in Blender, Intel really closed the gap with the 200S Boost enabled. The render times in scenes like Junk Shop and Classroom are now right alongside the AMD X3D chips and even a touch faster in Monster. Now, like I said about the CUDIM memory, that's obviously going to help push things to the absolute limit. 
but the MCE tests that I've got on here too, and also all the AMD results were done with a standard 8,000 mega transfers per second DDR5 kit, not Kudim. So if you're gonna run regular DDR5 like most people, you could expect right results around the MCE by enabling the Intel Boost and the BIOS instead. So you don't have to splash out on expensive Kudim to see the benefit, which I think is gonna be great for a lot of people being that 300 pound kit, not for everyone. Now moving over to the games, the story is going to be pretty consistent. In Crisis Remastered, the 285K trails the 9950X 3D by just a few frames on average, but the 1% lows are higher, which gives you noticeably smoother gameplay overall, which to be honest is a better trade-off than chasing a slightly higher peak FPS. Now Dirt 5 and Shadow of the Tomb Raider tell the same story, with the 285K sitting just a hair behind AMD in average frames, but right there in the mix once you move this up to 1440p or 4k like most people will and in Far Cry and Cyberpunk the results are effectively neck and neck even on the ray trace version of Cyberpunk the 285 keeps pace. Now just a quick mention for anyone that wonders why we do test in 1080p that's the smallest resolution possible which gives the easiest to read results when you go to 1440p and 4k that all gets squashed together and it's really hard to tell the difference so the lower resolution you use the bigger gap you can see on the charts which is obviously easier to read so the 285k with the new 200s boost or s200 boost finally performs the way that it should do now the really nice part is you don't need to use a high-end board like the hero we've got here to actually get those clocks now the 200s boost brings that feature to the more affordable z890 and even mid-tier boards too so that means you get the near maximum performance straight from the BIOS without touching any power limits or advanced settings, which is a big, big step forward, especially for people that don't really like to dabble in the BIOS. It can be a very intimidating place that just saves having to buy a flagship board to get what you're paying for in the first place. If you're purely gaming, AMD's X3D lineup will still win by a tiny margin, but if you use your PC for anything more than that, better streaming maybe, editing, rendering, or if you use it for work, for example, the 285 is actually a pretty good contender now. Now, the other thing to note is now we've got an hour late refresh confirmed, so you're gonna have an actual upgrade path, which makes it far more easier to justify. I couldn't recommend getting one of these if there was nowhere to go with it. So now it's actually something that's a little bit more recommendable. So I hope you've enjoyed this one. It's been a bit more concise than my usual content, but I kind of wanted to pack as much information as I could into this one video. Thank you all for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. I'll leave the links to the 285K and also the memory and different bits and bobs that I've used in the description box below. Thank you all for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Please get subscribed and ding the bell if you did. And I'll see you all in the next one.